Pokemon has largely stuck to the same RPG gameplay they've had since the very first games came out 27 years ago. You travel the region in a mostly predetermined order, catching Pokemon, mowing down trainers, and collecting gym badges along the way until you've become champion of the Pokemon League. Fun stuff. But what if instead of a breezy RPG, Pokemon was reimagined as a relentlessly punishing roguelike? The result is the ROM hack Pokemon Emerald Rogue, and it is an absolute blast. In a roguelike, everything in the game is procedurally generated, meaning that the routes, items, Pokemon, and trainers you meet in Pokemon Emerald Rogue are different every time you play the game. It means that you have to be prepared for anything at any moment. And since I'm Flygon HG, I did my first playthrough of Emerald Rogue as a hardcore Nuzlocke, the rules for which are shown here and in the description down below. If you're like me and you've never played a roguelike before, the best way to understand how Emerald Rogue works is by watching it play out. And you came to the right place, because in my completely unbiased opinion, my first playthrough is a wild ride filled with action, adventure, adventure, heartbreak, and a super enticing fourth thing, so buckle up. But before we get started, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Red Magic. Red Magic is a series of gaming smartphones designed to give you the best gaming experience right in the palm of your hand. Their newest smartphone, the Red Magic 8 Pro, is a futuristic masterpiece featuring an ultra-fast Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor, a full AM OLED display, 520Hz shoulder triggers, all combining to create one of the most advanced gaming smartphones on the market. The bottom line is that playing games on this phone feels so, so smooth. Playing Pokemon Ultimate feels just like playing on the Switch, and for the first time ever, I was able to do my tap tap taps in Pokemon Go without any lag whatsoever. Plus, with game space features, you can access a range of plugins that can be used to customize your gameplay experience, all without ever leaving the game. The Red Magic 8 Pro also looks gorgeous. Mine is silver and has a transparent back that lets you see the RGB lights of the internal fan that keeps your phone cool while you game. But if you hate cute, colorful little fans, you can also get the Red Magic 8 Pro with a black matte backing. So if you're interested in gaming on the go, regardless of where you stand on cute, colorful little fans, then you should use the link in the description and pin comment down below to learn more about the Red Magic 8 Pro today, or tomorrow, or whenever. Just note that if you're interested in using the Red Magic 8 Pro as your primary smartphone, please make sure your cell provider is compatible before making your purchase. Thanks so much to Red Magic for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. My journey through Emerald Rogue begins the same way as any Hoenn playthrough begins, in the back of a moving van. But instead of arriving in Little Root Town with my mother, I arrive in a nondescript location with Scott, who's either my dad in this ROM hack, or ha has a lot of explaining to do. Driving a child to the middle of nowhere in the back of a truck? Not a great look, Scott. This mostly barren area is known as the Pokemon Hub, or P-Hub for short and it's where every procedurally generated run in Emerald Rogue begins. The only thing to do in P-Hub is talk to Professor Birch, who gives me my choice of three randomized starters. Ghastly, Pichu, and Bellsprout. A free ghost type seems like a no-brainer, so Helium the Ghastly joins the team. And then, just like that, we're off, and my very first run of Emerald Rogue has officially begun. After making my way through a long and foreboding tunnel, I appear on what's best described as a randomly generated world map in a Mario game. My goal is to maneuver through this world map by following branched paths that lead to different levels, which are called encounters, and can be anything from a randomly generated route with trainers and Pokemon, to a rest stop where you can purchase items. At the end of each world map, after completing several encounters, is a boss battle randomly drawn from one of the eight Hoenn gym leaders. If I beat this boss, I get a gym badge, and I'm sent to a new world map with a new boss waiting for me. And I repeat this until I've defeated all eight gym leaders, and then ultimately the Elite Four and Champion, at which point I've won the run. When you say it like that, it seems pretty straightforward, but it's actually pretty complicated and there's a lot to think about. As I enter my first encounter, I'm thrust into a randomly chosen route that's essentially Route 117 west of Mobile City. The first thing I do is pick up some items, which as you might be able to tell, are completely randomized. As with any roguelike, item management is important in this game, because universal healthcare has been, for the most part, completely abolished. No longer are there free Pokemon centers that I can visit whenever I please. Anyways, it's time to get another Pokemon. So into the tall grass I go, 
And it looks like my second teammate is a powerful and likely very thirsty Lepra. You're a long way from home, Hydrogen, but welcome to the team. We've already talked a lot about the mechanics of this game, so I don't really want to get too bogged down on the nitty gritty, but there are just a few more important things to clarify. First, Pokemon moves and game mechanics are updated to Generation 8, meaning that this game features the physical special split, 1.5 times critical hits, terrain, and pretty much everything else. Second, since this is my first playthrough, only the first three generations of Pokemon are featured. Future generations are unlocked in subsequent playthroughs. And third, for the hardcore Nuzlockers out there, level caps and permadeath are already built into the game. You can still use items in battle, but I won't because hardcore Nuzlocke or whatever. Okay, that should be it, so now we can really get moving. Since I can only catch one Pokemon per encounter, there's not really much else to do here other than defeat a very soft trainer with a Chansey. Besides selling items, trainer battles are one of the most consistent ways to get money, so especially early on, when the risk of losing a Pokemon is low, it behooves you to fight as many as you can. In the next encounter, described as the calm, gloomy route, I catch an Absol. More like a calm, absolutely route, but I'm not complaining. Mercury is another pretty incredible encounter to get so early on, and in randomizers, which this ROM hack basically is, it's great to have Pokemon with immunities. The final level before the boss battle is a Mart rest stop, where I'm able to purchase various TMs, including Pokeballs, potions, and a few randomly selected TMs. The one that catches my eye, and is in my price range, is the TM for Psychic. Two of my Pokemon are weak to fighting type attacks, and since Brawly is one of the potential boss battles, I figured that Psychic, despite only being single use in this game, is a pretty solid investment. And it turns out, I figured right, because the first gym leader is Brawly. And since Helium is my moderately strategic choice for a lead, I can just spam Psychic through his entire team and win the very first gym badge of Emerald Rogue. So, with the first boss battle defeated, we're transported to a new world map with a whole new batch of randomized paths to choose from. Chat encourages me to do the encounter represented by the well-dressed gentleman on the topmost path, and in the spirit of discovery, I oblige. But folks, the spirit of discovery is stupid. This well-dressed gentleman is stupid. And chat, as I should know by now, is stupid. No offense, chat. Turns out that the well-dressed gentleman is the host of a game show that consists of four rounds where I have to choose between two buttons. One button causes something good to happen, and the other causes something bad to happen. It's pure RNG chaos, every Nuzlocke's nightmare. Round one drops the IVs of all of my Pokemon, but then round two at least buffs the IVs of Mercury the Absol. Round three lights $1,000 on fire, but then round four gives me $10,000. So in the end, I think I come out net positive. Still, I'm never doing that again. On to the next encounter, which appears to be Route 120 east of Fortree City. There, my encounter is a Meowth. Not a particularly amazing Pokemon, but Gold can learn Payday, which I can use to farm money against wild Pokemon, so she's not totally worthless. Thanks to choosing the world's dumbest game show, that's my only route encounter before the second gym leader. The third and final encounter of this stretch is a full rest stop, which is like the Mart rest stop, but it also lets me heal for free. There's also two NPCs that'll sell me battle items, and a few others that'll teach my Pokemon new moves. For money, obviously, which I don't have a lot of. But after that, it's time to face down the second random gym leader, and this time it's Winona. She leads with a Crobat, and I lead with Mercury. I'm a little worried that she knows Leech Life, so I switch to Helium, who's evolved into a Haunter. A Confuse Ray indicates that Crobat probably doesn't have Leech Life, so I switch back to Mercury on a bite. Crobat just starts going for Air Cutter, which is definitely better than Confuse Ray. Two slashes and a quick attack are enough to finish off the Speedy Bat, though Mercury is pretty low by the time it's all said and done. Pelipper comes in second and sets up the rain with a drizzle, so it's off to Hydrogen as Pelipper goes for U-turn. This brings in Skip Plume. I nail her with a quad effective priority ice shard that ends up getting the one shot. It was a crit, which might have mattered, but it was also a Skip Plume. Not exactly God's strongest warrior, so maybe the crit didn't matter. Pelipper comes back out, but with the rain set up, Sparkling Aria does huge damage as she just sets up Mist. Then she opts for U-Turn, which does very little damage, and brings in Skarmory, who gets eviscerated by another rain-boosted Sparkling Aria. So Pelipper comes back in for the third time, but with nowhere to go, she's down by one last Sparkling Aria, winning us the second gym badge. Which means that it's time for a new board. I know where we're not going, that's for sure. 
On an average misty route, I catch a Rhyhorn. Since this is generations 1 through 3, there's no chance at Rhyperior, but even as just a Rhyhorn, Titanium is a solid bulky addition to the roster. After that, it's time for a special type of encounter, represented by an off-color patch of grass in the overworld map. These puppies house strong Pokemon, heavily borrowing from the aesthetic of Gen 5's hidden grottos. Who knows what sort of fearsome and mighty creature we're about to face? A Dragonite? A Salamence? A Tyranitar? Okay, well Wigglytuff is definitely not amazing, but she's also not terrible. Wigglytuff has immunities to Ghost and Dragon-type attacks, which will be super useful for Elite Four members Phoebe and Drake. That is, assuming I manage to keep this mediocre Pokémon alive until then. Florine also does have her hidden ability competitive, in addition to a pretty cracked moveset. So never judge a book by its soft, puntable cover. The final encounter in this world map is a battle prep rest stop, which are important for getting held items, teaching my Pokémon new moves, and purchasing evolutionary items. Specifically, Helium needs a Link Cable to evolve into Gengar. This battle prep rest stop doesn't have one, but eventually one will. Just like in regular Emerald, my third gym leader ends up being Watson. Fortunately, we just got a Ground-type Pokémon. Watson leads with Ampharos, and my educated guess of a lead in Hydrogen turns out to be pretty bad. Fortunately, it's a free switch to Titanium on a Thunderbolt. In fact, it's more than free since we get a sweet, sweet special attack boost. It's over for you now, Watson. I go for Bulldoze, but Ampharos surprises me with a Focus Blast tech that would have absolutely been the first death of the run if it didn't have 13% accuracy. I just got incredibly lucky. Bulldoze didn't kill and Rhyhorn is aggressively slow, so I switched to Helium on another Focus Blast. With Leftovers Recovery, I'm a little worried that we won't get the kill with a Sludge Bomb, but Helium rises to the occasion. Electabuzz is second for Watson, so it's back to Titanium as he sets up Light Screen, which is obviously fine. Watson switches out, indicating that his Electabuzz doesn't have a way to damage my ground type. The Electrode that takes his spot is immediately felled by a Bulldoze, which brings in Manetric next. I'm not sure what he'll do, so I switch to Gold, now a Persian, who gets nailed by a nasty overheat. A Fake Out does good chip and causes a flinch. So, anticipating a Thunderbolt, I head back to Titanium. Though a second overheat indicates that Manetric is likely locked into overheat with a Choice Scarf or even a Choice Specs. Some quick math tells me that we're safe to even a critical hit overheat, so I stay in with Titanium and take out Manetric with a Bulldoze. That just leaves Electabuzz, but we already know that he's got nothing to damage Titanium with. One last Bulldoze, and we've won the third Gym Badge. As we're teleported to our newest board, we've got a bit of a problem. Unlike in regular Pokémon games, Emerald Rogue doesn't have a PC system. I'm limited to just the six Pokémon that I can carry at any time. If I want to catch another one, I have to permanently replace one of my current team members. So, when Magby is revealed as my next possible encounter, I decide to just commit a murder and move on. Remember, this is Generations 1 through 3, so there's no Magmortar. This route also has a few random trainers on it that I make sure to take out for some more spending money. Most of the random trainers in this game are pretty straightforward, but School Kid Challenger has the worst thing you can run into in any randomized Nuzlocke. No, not Azatu, though she is pretty annoying to take out thanks to Confuse Ray and Hydrogen electing to hit himself in confusion four turns in a row. But I'm actually talking about School Kid Challenger's second Pokémon, Wobbuffet. For the uninitiated, Wobbuffets are brutal to face up against if you aren't prepared for them. Their ability Shadow Tag means that most Pokémon can't switch out, and with access to Counter, Mirror Coat, and Destiny Bond, things can get really ugly really quickly. Hydrogen's moveset is three special attacking moves and Rain Dance, so the only way to kill this thing is with special damage. If I miss out on the kill and Wobbuffet goes for Mirror Coat, Hydrogen is dead. I can set up Rain Dance to buff Sparkling Aria, but I don't even know if that's enough for the KO, even with our massive level advantage. I could try to go for Freeze Dry, my weakest move, and hope that even if Wobbuffet does use Mirror Coat, the damage she deals in return won't be enough to kill Hydrogen. I can gain back a bit of HP with Leftovers by spamming Rain Dance here as well. Wobbuffet ends up going for Safeguard, which means that that was a free turn to go for an attack, but there's obviously no way to know that she'd do that. She then starts going for Destiny Bond, which is also really scary, because if I kill her on the turn after she uses Destiny Bond, Hydrogen will die. And with Rain Dance only having 5 PP, I can't even stall her out of Destiny Bond. 
The good news is that when I go for a freeze dry, it does 50%, and Wobbuffet just goes for another Destiny Bond instead of Miracle. The bad news is that I only have two Raindance PP left. So, if Wobbuffet just keeps spamming Destiny Bond for two more turns, I'll have no choice but to kill her, and my sweet little teammate will die. But by the grace of Arceus, Wobbuffet clicks Mirror Coat on the next turn, which means I'm safe to kill her with an Ice Beam, and against all odds, Hydrogen lives to see another day. That was absolutely not worth $310. But after crawling our way out of that hellish battle, it's off to Petalburg Woods where my next potential teammate is a mother frickin' shuckle, baby. This fat little wall of a Pokemon would be a pretty incredible addition to the team, so I catch him and say farewell to Gold the Persian. She served us well, but I think Boron will be a bit more useful going forward. After another trick to a Link cable as battle prep rest stop, it's time for the fight against the fourth gym leader, Norman. Fortunately, I had the foresight to teach Mercury close combat for this exact potential matchup. She's holding a newly purchased Focus Sash as well, but she won't need it for Ursarang who goes down in one fell swoop. Giraffe Ridge is next, and we can use a priority Sucker Punch to just take her out in one shot, no problem. Third is Delcaddy, and I'm expecting a fake out, so it's off to Helium. She then switches into Zigzagoon, who gets nailed by a nasty Sludge Bomb. Then we outspeed on the next turn, and down he goes. Delcaddy comes back out, which seems to indicate that neither she nor Norman's final Pokemon have a way to hit Helium for any damage. I almost have a heart attack as she goes for Sucker Punch, only for it to fail, because Delcaddy has the ability Normalize, which changes all her moves into Normal-type moves for a small boost in damage. It's a pretty stupid ability. Last for Norman is Ditto, who instantly transforms into the spitting image of my starter. This gives me a pretty safe switch back into Mercury though, who shrugs off a critical hit Shadow Ball, and then takes out the Imposter with a Sucker Punch on the following turn. That's badge number four. So, off to a new board, and our first encounter is another randomized route where I find a Slowpoke. Slowbro is obviously quite good, and it might be a good idea to replace Florine with him, but the idea of a Dragon-type immunity is just too enticing, so I perhaps foolishly pass on the poke. The next encounter is another randomized route. In fact, it's the same route as our very first encounter, but the Pokemon are obviously completely different. I find a little fly, and despite being a personal favorite, he's obviously not worth replacing one of my six team members for. He wouldn't even be able to evolve into Yanmega. So that just leaves another battle prep rest stop, which finally lets me purchase a Link Cable. Unfortunately, Helium will need to level up while holding the Link Cable to evolve, and since we're already at the level cap, he'll need to wait until we beat the 5th gym leader, who for me, is Wan. And he's got Perma Rain. Apparently after 4 gym badges, all the boss battles will have a favorable field effect active during their fight. In Wan's case, however, his Perma Rain is completely useless. Hydrogen knows Freeze Dry, which is an Ice type move that does super effective damage into Water types. So by clicking that single move over and over and over again, Hydrogen can take out every last one of Wan's Pokemon, winning us an easy fifth gym badge. Other than Helium finally evolving into Gengar, there's not too much to report before the next boss fight. I contemplate replacing Titanium with an Onyx I find during the first encounter, since having a Steel-type in Steelix might be better than Rhydon, but ultimately I decide that it's not worth it, since I would need to find or purchase a Metal Coat to evolve him anyways. I end up finding three Metal Coats literally on the same route, which is pretty ridiculous, but not going for Onyx ends up being a blessing in disguise, as you'll see later. Also, this Magma Grunt here had a Blaziken and a Tyranitar, which were an absolute nightmare to deal with. My team doesn't have particularly great matchups into Rock, Ground, or Fighting-type moves. Anyways, Gym Leader number 6 is Liza from Tate and Liza fame. During her battle, there's permanent Psychic Terrain, which boosts the power of Psychic-type moves and prevents priority moves. This makes Mercury with Sucker Punch significantly less useful, which is definitely disappointing. But for now, my lead is Hydrogen, who can hit Solrock for super effective damage with Sparkling Aria. Unfortunately, that's not enough for the KO. Kind of a shock, and not great, since Solrock can retaliate with a super effective Rock Slide for nearly 50%. Lefties gets us back some HP as Solrock goes down, and Grumpig comes in second. This fella definitely has Power Gem, but I gamble by staying in and am immediately punished as Grumpig gets to set up a Calm Mind, essentially for free. Fortunately, Liza stays greedy and goes for a second Calm Mind as I switch to Mercury. I outspeed and hit the little piggy with a Night Slash. 
My heart drops as a Culverberry activates, but surprisingly, Mercury manages to still get the KO. Mr. Mime is third, and with her fairy type, she's not taking super effective damage from Night Slash. But I don't want her setting up on a switch, and we've got the Focus Sash, so it's relatively safe to go for a Night Slash. Mr. Mime lives and miraculously connects with a Focus Blast, bringing us down to 1 HP. But then another Night Slash gets the KO. Could have used that crit a turn earlier, buddy, but that's okay. Gardevoir is fourth and another fairy type, so it's off to the new and improved Helium, who takes big damage from a resisted Moonblast. That might be Specs damage, but we'll never know since a Sludge Bomb gets the KO on the following turn. Hypno is last, so it's a semi-risky switch into Mercury on a surprise belly drum. And then a Night Slash seals the deal, winning us badge number six. With the new board, my encounters are once again pretty underwhelming. A Piloswine that can't evolve into Mamaswine is an easy pass, and a Beedrill with no Mega Evolution is an even easier pass. My team isn't amazing, but we've got a couple heavy hitters, and knowing that the last two gym leaders have to be Roxanne and Flannery means that I can even prepare for things a bit better. I can also talk to this statue prior to each boss battle, and for a price, it'll tell me who to expect. I haven't done that up until this point, but since this will effectively give me two answers for the price of one, I cough out $7,000 to the mystical statue and find out that my next opponent is Flannery. She's got permanent sunup, so priority number one is to get rid of that. Her lead is Nene Tails and my lead is Boron. I'm a tad worried that she has Nasty Plot and I could heavily punish her by clicking Encore, but I'm not convinced that Boron would survive two sunboosted fire blasts if she just went on the offense. So I go to click Sandstorm and she Nasty Plots. Damn it. That makes this next pit pretty tricky and more than a little tedious. With leftovers and protect, Boron can somewhat safely chip away at Nene Tails and set up sticky webs to slow down Flannery's team when they switch in. My goal is to lock her Vixen into Nasty Plot with Encore, getting me a safe switch to one of my other teammates. But the best I can do is lock her into Energy Ball with plus four special attack. That's not amazing, but it does let me switch into Helium, who gets nailed by a very rude critical hit. But with all the Sandstorm chip, Nene Tails is at about 50%, and a Sludge Bomb is enough for the KO. Flannery has five more Pokemon though, and rather frustratingly, her second one, Rapidash, appears to have heavy duty boots on, since she's not slowed down by Boron Sticky Webs. Fair enough though, as a fire type trainer, you probably need to have contingency plans for Stealth Rock. Anyways, Rapidash likely came in second because she knows high horsepower, but I figure that Titanium is bulky enough to tank a couple of those, no problem. And I'm right. One doesn't do that much damage, all things considered. And after a second one, he's sitting at a little bit below 50% as an Earthquake gets the KO. That brings in Charizard next. My educated guess is that this bad boy has Solar Beam, which is why he comes in now. And if Charizard goes for that, we can just snipe him out of the sky with a Rock Blast on the turn that he has to charge up. Y you know, assuming that he doesn't have a Power Herb, which would be... bad. After a turn of protecting, Charizard does indeed go for Solar Beam, and he doesn't have a Power Herb, so Titanium is free to take him out with a single Rock Blast. Pretty lucky that we didn't miss that. Torkoal is fourth, which means that Flannery gets the sun back up. I decide to gamble that Earthquake is enough to one-shot Torkoal. The turtle is very bulky, yes, but Rhydon is very strong and holding a muscle band for just a little bit of extra power. That might be enough, and it turns out, it is. Torkoal goes down in one fell swoop, and Macargo is fifth, so we obviously get another one shot there, which means that Flareon is last. But Flannery seems to have doubled up on her heavy duty boots because this little asshole also doesn't get her speed dropped by my sticky webs. Which means she'll outspeed Titanium, and I'm not sure if he can survive a sun boosted attack from this much HP. But we're gonna find out. Flareon goes for Flare Blitz, and Titanium survives, but gets burned. Somehow though, Earthquake is still enough for the one shot. Titanium is absolutely unstoppable, and badge number seven is ours. For the record, Steelix could never. That means that the eighth and final gym leader will be Roxanne. So far, I've been completely deathless in this challenge, in large part to some pretty good luck. But our matchup against rock types isn't amazing since most of them know ground type moves, and our only water type Pokemon takes super effective damage from rock type attacks. At the very least though, Helium has Giga Drain, Mercury has Close Combat, Titanium has Earthquake, and Fluorine exists. 
But my alternatives from the last two encounters were Corsola, which is just simply too weak to be particularly useful, and Nuzleaf, which I wouldn't be able to evolve before fighting Roxanne anyways, so these six are gonna have to do it. As I step onto the battlefield, I find out that this battle is gonna feature a permanent sandstorm, something that I was not prepared for, despite it being pretty predictable based on the last few gym battles. This is bad for two reasons. One, the sandstorm chip means that the focus ashes on helium and mercury are effectively useless. And two, all of Roxanne's rock types will get a special defense boost with the sandstorm up, making hydrogen significantly worse. Fortunately, I am leading hydrogen who knows rain dance, so I theoretically could set up the rain right away. But I'm an idiot and a little afraid of taking a super effective rock move from this Macargo, so I just go for the easy kill. That was definitely a mistake, because even if Macargo has, like, Meteor Beam or something, Macargo is just not very good. And with Roxanne bringing in Cradley second, we've got a huge problem. Ice Beam definitely won't one-shot with the Sandstorm special defense boost, and I don't have an easy way to deal with her otherwise, other than a close combat from Mercury. But I'm worried that even if I can safely bring her in, which is a big if, a non-stab close combat won't be enough for the one-shot. So I go to Boron with the hopes of encoring Cradley into a useless move. This kinda works as we encore him into Toxic, though the downside is that Boron is now badly poisoned, and therefore significantly less useful. The other thing that's worth mentioning here is that Encore isn't as useful in this game as it is in regular Pokemon games, because the AI is actually smart enough to switch out if the move they're locked into is completely useless. So Cradley immediately switches out to Pseudo Wudo as Boron just goes for a pretty useless sticky webs. Pseudo Wudo might have Sturdy, so I decide to break the Sturdy with a Sludge Bomb, expertly dodging a Head Smash that easily could have killed Boron if it connected. If not just straight up, then probably from the toxic damage. So that was pretty stupid. I can now switch to Titanium, who takes a massive amount of damage from a critical hit head smash, which also reveals that Pseudo Wudo has Rock Head since he didn't take Recoil. Fortunately, Titanium can take out Pseudo Wudo with an Earthquake, but now Cradley comes back in. I switch to Florine on a Giga Drain that does way too much damage. This Pokemon sucks, but at least I can set up a wish as Cradley goes for Toxic. This grants me a safe switch back to Boron as Cradley sets up Stealth Rock, which is frankly also very, very bad. This battle is quickly becoming a disaster, and I am absolutely floundering. I'm doing too much switching and not enough attacking, but this Cradley is making that very hard to do. Boron manages to lock Cradley into Giga Drain, which gives me a safe-ish switch into Helium. Since Curse Body activates, I'm anticipating a switch, and I go for a Giga Drain of my own. Roxanne brings in a freaking Tyranitar, which is not what I wanted to see. We manage to crit, and Tyranitar barely takes 50%. I chalk that up to Titar's generally excellent special bulk and the buff from Sandstorm, but with a little bit more critical thinking, it's pretty clear that Titar here is holding an Assault Vest to get an additional 50% boost to his special defense. Fearing an Earthquake, I don't want to go to Mercury, so instead it's off to Hydrogen who gets smacked by a Foul Play. Mercury was probably the better option, but then again, with Mercury's massive attack stat and poor defense, Foul Play might have actually been enough for the one-shot after Stealth Rock and Sandstorm chip. But it does still feel like a misplay. Especially because Hydrogen freaking misses out on the KO with Sparkling Aria, and a Rock Blast kills him. Yeah, that was definitely a Salt Vest. R.I.P. Hydrogen, you did a phenomenal job, and I let you down. Mercury comes in to replace her fallen teammate, and a Night Slash finishes off the murderous Tyranitar. That brings in Golem, though, and just like that, we've got another problem. Because this f almost certainly has Sturdy. But hey, Pseudo-Wudo didn't, so who knows? Maybe this one's got Rockhead, too. Either way, there's no way to get out of this without some more deaths. The first step is to sacrifice Florine for a free switch. Thank you for your service, Florine. You are truly one of the teammates of all time. This grants me a safe switch to Helium, and he can hit Golem with a Giga Drain, but Golem has Sturdy. And despite having a Focus Sash on Helium, the Sandstorm Chip takes us out. Just like that, I've gone from a deathless run to losing half of my team right before the Elite Four. The silver lining is that Mercury can come in and clean up the rest of Roxanne's team. With 1 HP, Golem obviously goes down to any attack. Cradley comes back in and surprisingly just gets one shot by close combat. I know it's super effective, but close combat doesn't have stab and Cradley is pretty bulky, but I guess I just underestimated Mercury's raw power. 
Roxanne's last Pokemon is Corsola, so one last close combat sends her packing, and with that, the 8th gym badge is ours. But my team is in shambles. My Wallace answer is dead. My Drake answers are dead. And with just three Pokemon, Sydney, Phoebe, and Glacia are looking pretty impossible. The good news is that there are still encounters between each of these fights, so I do have a chance to get some more Pokemon and rebuild my team. Looking at the current board though, things don't look great. The top route will let me revive a fallen Pokemon, but I decide that that's definitely against the principal rule of Nuzlocking. The middle route starts with a Mart rest stop, which means I'll only get a single new Pokemon. But the bottom route features a standard route encounter where I can catch a new Pokemon, and then an encounter type that so far I've avoided like the plague. This encounter type here features a single battle against one tough trainer. But if you beat him, he'll give you one of his Pokemon. So with the bottom route, I can get two more Pokemon, so long as I can successfully beat the tough trainer. It's absolutely a gamble. High risk, high reward. But at this point, I figure that I kinda gotta go for it. Plus, chat reassures me that these tough trainers are type-based and a step down from gym leaders. With a little bit of luck, I might get a favorable matchup and salvage this run. So the first thing to do is enter the tough breezy encounter and get a fourth team member. I make a tactical decision to surf for my new Pokemon so that I can guarantee a water type. At the very least, this Pokemon will add some type coverage to my team, and it should be able to learn Ice Beam to deal with Drake's Dragon types. Honestly, I think it's a really logical plan. This ROM hack didn't buff any Pokemon, so this vanilla-ass love disc is possibly one of the worst water types I could have encountered. But hey, at least Chlorine is speedy. Well, that means that it's time to go face off against the tough trainer and pray that we have a good matchup. But my heart drops as I enter the encounter, and it's another freaking sandstorm. Which means that this guy probably specializes in rock, ground, or steel types. None of which are particularly great to see. It also means that Mercury's Focus Sash is once again useless. At the very least, I do have Chlorine, who can set up Rain Dances, and then who knows? Maybe Rain Boosted Surfs will do some solid, super effective damage. Nope. Not into Swampert, they won't. Well, we're clearly dealing with ground types here, so the first thing I do is set up Rain Dance with Chlorine as Swampert hits a yawn. This sucks. Chlorine can hit a Surf for useless damage, and then after a few turns, she falls to give me a safe switch into Mercury. With the Sandstorm gone, Mercury is safe to set up a Swords Dance. Or she would be if Swampert didn't have Yawn. Because now, if I kill Swampert, Mercury will fall asleep and be fodder for whatever comes in next. But I don't really have a choice. Boron and Titanium are no match for Swampert, so this is my only play. Now, Mercury does still have her Focus Dash intact, so it's pretty safe to assume that she'll survive for at least one turn. If she manages to wake up after a single turn, this could still be doable, assuming that we can get the one shot on whatever comes in next. You have got to be kidding me. Okay, Groudon. So here are my outs. Either I get the one turn wake up and manage to kill Groudon in one shot, or Groudon misses their attacks. I have no idea if Mercury, even at plus two, is remotely close to being able to kill a Groudon. With Stab, Night Slash has 105 base power, so close combat is better with 120 base power. But if neither gets the kill anyways, it's always better to use Night Slash since it has a higher chance of critting. And with Mercury's super luck ability, the chances of getting a critical hit with Night Slash are actually 50%. Of course, this is all assuming that she wakes up before Groudon kills her. On our first turn of Guaranteed Sleep, Groudon does not miss Precipice Blades, which, based on my experience with using Groudon in VGC, is BS, but whatever. The next turn is the important one. It is quite literally make or break. Come on, 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 Close combat with a kill! Oh! I threw! I threw so hard! Oh man, watching that again is so heartbreaking. Truly one of the 
biggest throws in my entire life. It looks like close combat absolutely would have gotten the kill there. I just straight up completely underestimated Mercury's raw power, and I've done that several times throughout this playthrough. In my defense though, Groudon is incredibly physically bulky, so the crit chance felt like the right play without knowing how much damage we'd do. It wasn't a play devoid of logic, it was just the wrong play. But man was I pissed at myself for that one. Still, it's technically not over, and if we win this, I'll be given a freaking Groudon. So let's not give up. Pyloswine is third, and by locking him into Rock Slide with Encore from Boron, Titanium can come in and safely dispose of him with two bulldozes. Though, since we already outsped, an Earthquake there would have saved us from a tiny bit of chip damage. Dugtrio is third and doesn't have Arena Trap, so I switch back to Boron on an Earthquake. I Encore to lock him into Stone Edge and then head back to Titanium. An Earthquake reveals that Dugtrio is holding a Focus Sash, so I have to switch back to Boron as Dugtrio's Encore ends. For whatever reason, he goes for Stone Edge, which is pretty annoying. And then, after we protect for a turn of Leftovers recovery, the Dugtrio goes for Memento. That brings Quagsire in fifth, which is obviously pretty bad, since presumably he'll just one-shot Boron with a quad-effective Water-type move. Even if we were to survive, I don't even think that Earthquake could get the one-shot anyways. So I have Boron try to poison Quagsire with Sludge Bomb as he goes for Scalds. And we go back and forth for a while. I make sure to protect every other turn for recovery and to theoretically stall him out of Scald PP, but the second we get burned, Boron's done. And soon enough, it happens. We don't even manage to poison Quagsire with any of our four Sludge Bombs, but a Protect reveals that Boron is at low enough HP that Quagsire now sees the kill with Scald and Earthquake, meaning his move choice should be random. So I just hard switch to Titanium, hoping to come in on an Earthquake. It's a Scald though, but somehow Titanium survives on 5 HP. And then an Earthquake is enough for the one-shot. Wait, did I just win this battle? If Titanium can kill this guy's sixth and final Pokemon with another Earthquake, then I actually win this. I don't know, man. You can't make this up. If I wasn't streaming this live, I'm pretty sure everyone would think this is fake. Because yeah, I just wiped to a freaking Flygon. Truth truly is stranger than fiction. There's a lot to unpack from those last two fights. There were a ton of misplays on my side in both battles, and even though I did have a string of pretty bad draws, it was ultimately those misplays that caused me to wipe. I should have been better prepared for Sandstorm in the Rock Sand fight, I could have used Stealth Rock to break potential sturdies, and I should have been much more aggressive with going for KOs. The same is true for the last fight. Had I just clicked Close Combat on Groudon, Mercury would have lived. Then again, Dugtrio had a Focus Sash, so Mercury probably would have gone down and we would have wiped a Flygon anyways. But still, misplays are misplays. And that's not even considering the risky and ultimately stupid decision to try and fight the tough trainer in the first place. Not to completely blame chat or anything, but that was absolutely not easier than a gym leader. So lesson learned. I'm pretty sure I'll get plenty of comments from people that have never played this game yelling at me for playing suboptimally or for overthinking or for having a playstyle that's too conservative. And while I'd kindly encourage you to not do that because it's kind of mean, I guess you gotta do what you gotta do. Despite that, I wanted to make a video on this run because I think it's important to highlight failure. If I won every single challenge I posted on my channel, not only would it rob all videos of any dramatic tension, it'd also make it seem like I always won everything I tried, which is absolutely not true. It's why I also include the failed attempts in my challenge videos. Failing is an ugly but necessary part of growth. As with any defeat, it's important to acknowledge where you went wrong and learn from the loss. You have to take the information you gained and use it to improve your plays next time and avoid making the same mistakes again. And you gotta do your best to not beat yourself up about it. I'm still struggling with that last bit. At the end of the day, playing Pokemon Emerald Rogue was so much fun and it was such a wonderful change of pace from the usual Pokemon ROM hacks. Yes, my first playthrough ended in abject failure, but I can't wait to try again. And what's so cool is that every time I play, it'll be a brand new experience, especially after I unlock the Pokemon from later generations. There's so many opportunities for rich and unique playthroughs in this game. So comment down below if you want to see more videos like this one about my future Nuzlocke challenges in Emerald Road. And until then, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. 
or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the two best ways to directly support the channel. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.